Hey gang, we are in New York, the state of New York right now. We're in a town called Auburn, Auburn, New York. And we're actually on a street called Burt Street. And back in the 1890s, a very tragic murder-suicide happened here. A young woman who was married murdered her, well, she murdered her husband and very young child. And then she killed herself right down the street here. We're gonna go to the house You've seen the famous picture, now I'm going to give you the story behind it. And then we're going to go to the cemetery. So let's take a walk down this neighborhood. A lot of these houses are original from the 1800s. Of course, many have been refurbished. But let's just walk down the sidewalk and let's take ourselves back to those early times, those simpler times. in Auburn. You can just imagine the street, 1894. Horses, wagons, carriages. There was no asphalt. It was gravel, mud. I'm going to actually read to you from the Weekly News and Democrat, Auburn, New York. Wednesday, 31st. January of 1894, the article. And it really gives you a feeling of how things were back then. Mr. and Mrs. Keller were natives of Switzerland, the former being from Zurich. They came to this country about five years ago and Keller secured employment as a gardener in Philadelphia. He afterwards went to Washington, D.C. He was an excellent gardener, and his work attracted a lot of attention. Something over two years ago, he came to this city to take a position as a gardener at the Osborne residence. He had an excellent reputation for sobriety and industry and was highly esteemed by all who knew him. He loved his wife devotedly and was never happier than when in her company. This love was reciprocated and it is said that there was not a single hindrance to the marital blessedfulness. Another child was born to Mrs. Keller some years ago, but it only lived 13 days. Mrs. Keller was a well-educated woman and a very fine pianist. The zither, violin, and numerous other instruments were completely mastered by her. And as her husband was also a musician of more than ordinary ability and was also a fine man. Keller was a member of the Herman Lodge, DOH. He had a hearty friendship of every member of the organization. It is not known whether or not Mr. or Mrs. Keller have any relatives living in the United States. Mrs. Keller's father, it is said, is living in Switzerland. He's 83, and he is engaged in teaching music. Adolf. Hickstein, a piano maker residing at number 10 and 1 half Burt Avenue, was playing games with other members of his family at his cozy home at 8.30 when he heard a report, followed by a quick cry for help coming from the Keller residence. Mr. and Mrs. Hickstein immediately went to the Keller residence the kitchen door was open, and prostrate upon the floor at its very threshold lay Keller. Kitchen door was open, and scarcely had the discovery been made when the report of a pistol was heard. Going into the bedroom, Mrs. Hickstein was horrified to see Mrs. Keller her lower extremities in the bed and her head in the crib of her infant, 
by her bedside and blood issuing from her forehead. The clothes of the child were in flames, which Mr. Hickstein quickly extinguished. Neither he or his wife, even at that time, entirely comprehended the horrible spectacle presented. Both were excited, and as soon as they had extinguished the fire in the child's clothing, Mr. Hickstein ran to the residence of Ferdinand Sibis, number 24, Elizabeth Street, and informed the family that a tragedy had been enacted, but the details he could not tell. Mrs. Sibis at once went to the Keller house, and several of the neighbors arrived here at the same time. Mrs. Keller was still breathing, but there was no life in her husband's form when he was raised from the floor. A bullet hole in the left side told only too plainly what had happened. Strong hands raised Mrs. Keller to the bed. Her right hand, she clutched a revolver, a 22 caliber weapon. Mrs. Sibus grabbed the infant, whose pitiful cries had been neglected till this time. Hastily wrapping it up, she carried it to her home. No one had thought that any injury had befallen the child. When Mrs. Sibis reached her home, however, she was horrified to find a bullet hole in the little one's body. The region of the stomach on the right side is where it was. The bullet had gone clear through the little one's body, and Mrs. Sibis immediately took the child back to its home, where in the meantime, Dr. Sheldon Voorhees and J.M. Jenkins had arrived. The physicians found a wound in Mrs. Keller's head just above the temple on the right side. They saw at once that there was no chance for her recovery and preparations were at once made to remove her body to the city hospital. A call was sent for the ambulance and it responded promptly. The news of the tragedy had spread the wildfire, like wildfire, and a large crowd now had gathered at the house, all willing to render assistance in their power, but really impeding the physicians and those who were assisting them in their work. Policemen, however, managed to clear out the crowd. When the ambulance arrived, Mrs. Keller was placed in it and removed to the hospital. Dr. Voorhees took the little one in his own buggy to the same institution. Coroner Tripp was notified and ordered the body of Mrs. Keller removed to gross undertaking rooms, along with husband and daughter. There is only one explanation advanced as to the woman's motive for the deed. Five weeks ago, she was taken to the city hospital for treatment. At this time, she did not talk rationally, and although she had never made any threats or acted in a violent manner, it was thought best to have her undergo treatment. She was taken from the hospital about two weeks ago to her home. During the mother's stay at the hospital, the little one had been with her, while the husband had boarded in the family of his friend Sibus. The husband seemed overjoyed when his wife came back home and the woman seemed to be entirely rational. She too was happy at the thought again of being home and it seemed as if the cloud which had hung over them was dispelled. She was bright and cheerful to her husband and to her friends. The only strange action that was noticed Thursday came to the attention of a caller Mrs. Keller was seated at the piano, fingering the keys mechanically, and was crying bitterly. The neighbor spoke of this to Mrs. Keller, and she made some remark to change the subject. She cheered up considerably and said she felt well. 
theories can only explain the circumstances of the tragedy. Generally accepted by those who knew the family well to this effect, Mr. Keller left his home every evening at 8 o'clock to go to the residence of Mrs. D.M. Osborne, where he was employed as a gardener and attended to the fires in the greenhouses. Thursday night, his wife retired early, as was her custom. Mr. Keller started as usual to go to his work. It was his custom to kiss his wife goodbye before leaving home, and it was thought he went to her bedside that night and kissed her. It is surmised that she raised up in the bed and fired the shot that cost his life just as he gave evidence of his love. And we are at the house. This is the house. This looks to be the original house and it is unoccupied as far as I know, as far as I can see. And you can only imagine that, that well, this is the house. You, you just have to imagine. This is where it happened, guys. Look at that roof detail. It's probably the original. And this is probably the bedroom where it happened. Right here. Well, now you can see the place where it happened, the famous picture, guys. Ten Birch Street, Auburn, New York. We're going to head to the cemetery now and pay our respects. We are at the cemetery. It's called Fort Hill. And I'm at the very, very high point of the cemetery. We're going to be walking down to the stone. The stone is buried in the ground. Of course, it's one stone for all three that are buried together. Very old. Uh, we're in the old section, of course, a very old cemetery. You're going to see, so we're going to see some really beautiful monuments and topography. Also, let's take the walk. And I'm going to continue to read from the newspaper, the story. As we look at some amazing stones and monuments. Dramatic view up here. You can just feel like you're back in the 1800s, I'll tell you. So the story continues at the cemetery, three in one casket. Emil Keller, wife and baby, united in death. Shortly after 6 o'clock Friday night, death came to the relief of little Anna Keller at the city hospital. Of course, little Anna is the baby, baby girl. It was found that the bullet from the mother's revolver had penetrated the infant's right lung and had come out the left side. The body of the child was removed to Goss's undertaking rooms and prepared for burial with its parents. Throughout the day Saturday, throngs of people visited the undertaking rooms to view the remains. Father, mother, and daughter of course, we're buried in the same casket, which was a special order, about four inches deeper and nine inches wider than the ordinary and covered with gray embossed plush. The plate read, Our Darling. The head of Mrs. Keller rested on the left shoulder of her husband, thus hiding from view the wound in her temple and partly covering a discoloration of the right eye. 
There were traces of suffering in the woman's face, but her husband looks as if he were in a slumber. His left arm encircled the body of his wife while his right rested on his hip. Between the mother and father was the infant, a handsome, plump child. Its right hand was clasped by the left of its mother while it rested its left on the mother's left arm. The mother and the infant were laid out in plain white shrouds while the husband and father had a coat and vest of plain black and trousers of a dark pattern. Viewed by thousands is the title as the article continues. The Keller family funeral was attended by a large crowd. The last sad rites over the remains of Emil Keller, his wife Mary, and their baby Annie were performed at the Universalist Church Sunday afternoon. It seemed as if half of Auburn had turned out. The crowd surrounding the Gosses' undertaking rooms in Genesee Street about half the Universalist Church in South Street into Lincoln and Exchange Streets and numbering several hundred. Half an hour before the time appointed, the front doors of the Universalist Church were opened, but it was scarcely three minutes before the church was crowded. Only the front seats in the center of the church were reserved for the members of the DOH who attended the funeral in a body. It required several police to keep the crowds in front from filling in the aisles of the church. As the funeral procession entered the church, the organist, Miss Hattie Chapel, played a funeral march. The communion table had been removed in front of the pulpit and heavy black covered pedestals occupied the central position. And on them rested the casket during the funeral services. On the cover of the casket were a number of beautiful floral designs from Mrs. D. M. Osborne, a wreath from Mr. and Mrs. Henry Wegman, and a beautiful wreath of roses from florist Alfred Patrick. The service opened with prayer by Reverend O. M. Hilton, pastor of the church. And the choir sang in German, sweet and quiet is their sleep, as an opening selection Mr. Hilton followed with readings from the scripture. After which he spoke of the sad event. His remarks were full of Christian love and sympathy and moved everyone. A number of those who were present were brought to tears. Mr. Hilton said that on the 25th day of last June, he met for the first time the three who lay in the coffin before him, the father, mother, and child. We were glad to welcome them to our church, he said, where we found in Mrs. Keller a woman of rare intelligence. We found that she was a thorough musician and she played at one of our concerts and later at the pastor's home. We heard encouraging reports from her home. She was a devoted and loving wife to her husband and child. We next heard of her illness when she was taken to the city hospital for treatment. We feared for her. We feared for her when we heard that her mind was diseased, but as she recovered and grew stronger, all had hopes of her recovery. 
The pastor and his wife visited her at the hospital, and we next hear that she was removed to the home again. And then we next hear of this terrible tragedy and ask why God permitted it. When we answer this question, we answer all. It was a plan of the infinite God who is full of love. Disease fastened itself on the brain of this poor woman, and since God permitted it, no responsibility rested on the woman. At such a time as this, there are true friends to sympathize, true friends from the fatherland. The different nationalities are forgotten at such a time as this, and there was sadness in the hearts of all, all here today. The choir sang as a closing selection, After the service, the casket was removed to the vestibule of the church and the crowds in the church and all those on the outside were given an opportunity to view the remains. It was roughly estimated that upwards of 5,000 people viewed the remains at the undertakers and at the church. And it was about 5.30 when the funeral procession left the church for Fort Hill Cemetery, where the internment took place. And so ends the article. We are at the home section here, and their grave is, is right over there. And we're going to go down these stairs and pay respects. Well, you have to imagine, again, the road we see before us, the road we just crossed, gravel and mud, horses, carriages. Imagine how many people were here, 5,000 at the church, at least a thousand at the cemetery. And they buried the family together. Right up here, it's the first grave, right on the side of the road. Again, a road that you, you sit here and you just imagine was lined all the way down there. Horses and carriages, wagons probably all the way out to the entrance of the cemetery. Everyone dressed in black, Victorian style, to the Gilded Age. They came here to pay their respects and see them off. And it was unloaded from the hearse right here. There was a hole that was prepared, and it is here where they were buried. And there's the stone. And you can see it says, Emil, Maria, Anna. Emil, Maria, and Anna. And then in German, Probably a prayer, if anyone can translate that, that would be great. A second of silence. I can see the, the month January. 
I believe, 25th. Not sure. And then some writing below. Beautiful stone it was. You can still read it. But in a few more decades, you won't be able to read it anymore. It's sad that we only have one picture, and that is a death picture. I'm sure there were a lot of happy times at that house that they had together, and let's try to, let's try to imagine that. Rest in peace, Keller family.